remember I told you yesterday that I'd bring a little air pressure device in today. Um, we're ready whenever you're ready. Okay, well, I look outside today and it's not a nice day, is it? Okay, and we're under 101.3. We're bouncing around a little bit. When it, you know how some days it's beautiful, clear, blue skies? It's usually at around 102, 103 kilopascals when we have the cold front moving in. So next week when we, we're supposed to have cold weather next week, right? Yes. We've been watching the weather. We'll, we'll check it again then. Okay. So let's get started. Go back to past loss. Okay, a little bit about where we've been. And just a reminder, I adjusted this a little bit. We talked yesterday about what air pressure was. We talked about the fact that there's atmospheric air pressure. Who recognizes this device that I've sandwiched in? It's a pressure gauge. Have you all checked the tire pressure on your cars? Yes. That's what you use. This is America, so it's in pounds per square inch. Everywhere else in the known universe, it's in kilopascals. America is still using pounds per square inch. I put it here so you could help visualize the idea that what gas pressure is, is the effect of all of those collisions of particles on the wall or on a gauge if we've attached the, the gauge to the wall. And that we have a variety of readings that we can do for it. We can use pounds per square inch if we're doing the non-standard ones, or we can use an atmosphere kilopascals, millimeters of mercury, or tors. And of course, we're going to be using pressure for our gas laws, for Boyle's law, Charles law, Gay-Lussac's law. And we're going to go in order. Okay. Um, and again, our electronic version of the barometer, when we're recording air pressure, we're recording the pressure of all of these particles pushing down originally on mercury or now on a digital device to give us a measure of what that air pressure is. We did this yesterday. Okay, we're going to start with Boyle's Law. Read for me what Boyle's Law says over there. Volunteer to interpret that mathematical thing on the board. Using your own words, what does it say about volume and pressure? Ooh, you don't know the symbol. It's alpha, right? Yeah, it's alpha. Oh my gosh. Okay. It is alpha, but it's also a symbol that is used for proportions. So you haven't done proportions in math. What it means is volume varies with pressure. Now there's a difference between this one and this one. This, there's no fraction. This one, there is a fraction. So the first one says volume varies inversely with pressure. When one goes greater, the other one gets lower. I want you to take your hand and put it on your other arm and press. Feel the pressure. Okay, that's pressure. We're going to put some pressure on this system. Okay. And I'm going to walk around with this to every table, but can you see that there's air in here? There's air in the top and there's air in the dropper. As I come around to your bench, I want you to look at what's inside the dropper. If I put pressure on the top, I'm putting it in the hot seat. What happens to the volume in the, of air in the dropper? It, air is compressible. I'm putting it under pressure. I am compressing the air that's in that dropper. Ooh. Don't look at the water. Look at the air that's in the dropper. Why does it dive down? It's not the pressure pushing it down. It's something called buoyancy. Do you know, know what buoyancy is? Yeah. Okay, you've all floated in a swimming pool. You take a deep breath in and you float higher. You let the air out, you go down. Well, it's not a matter of how much air you have, it's what the volume of the air is. So when I squeeze the bubble, I decrease the volume and I lower the buoyancy. 
when I release the pressure to take the pressure off, the volume increases. The buoyancy increases and it comes up. This is called a Cartesian diver. And you can make them at home. If you put, it, if you put the dropper in a two liter soda bottle and you squeeze, it'll drop down. I like doing it in the graduated cylinder because you can get a good feel for the volume. You can almost measure the volume in the, t in the dropper as you go down. See it getting smaller, see it getting larger. Okay. There is an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. And if we draw a graph of that, it looks like this. Okay. Our volume is going to respond to the pressure. As we increase the pressure, the volume will decrease. The relationship between volume and pressure via Boyle's Law. We can also see it on here. This is an animation from FET. I'm going to decrease the volume a little bit. Okay. So it's giving us a gauge, an animated gauge here, where we can get kind of a reading for it. Okay. If we decrease the volume, we can see the pressure massively increasing until it pops off. Okay. Okay. Where there is a relationship, there is a math and problems to be done. Whoops. Now, there's an overall equation that looks like this. Pressure over volume, pressure times volume over temperature equals pressure. This is combined, pressure, volume, and temperature. I like to keep this on the wall because people get the feeling that there's so many equations to keep track of, but there really isn't. Whenever you are doing a problem, you want to look and see what you are given. So let's take our balloon on a journey and see what happens. That means we need a balloon. This is an estimation game. Remy, in milliliters, approximate a volume for us. You're guessing. I'll give you a hint. This is one liter in here. So that would be 1,000 mils. What do you like? 300 mils? OK, we'll go with that. So we're going to say that our balloon is at 300 milliliters. Hello? Of course, it would misbehave. Been behaving all day long. Oh, we'll just do it. Do it on the board if it's not going to behave. But I'm annoyed. It's been behaving itself. Let's make sure we're plugged in. Hopefully. Our V1, we give up. We use the blackboard. <laughs> Low tech. You always want to divide, define your variables. Our V1, we're saying, is 300 milliliters. We're going to drop a decimal down here because we don't want to round to one significant figure. Our pressure, we're going to say, is normal atmospheric pressure. So we're going to let it be 101.3 kilopascal. We're going to take our balloon on a journey. It's filled with helium. 
we're at the shopping mall and we release it. Our kid brother releases it. Goes all the way up into the atmosphere, okay, to where the pressure is actually only 35 kilopascal. Your job is to find out what the volume of the balloon will be. Will it be bigger or smaller than 300 milliliters? What do you think? If our pressure is decreasing, our volume should be increasing. I would probably have to restart the computer. We're not going okay. When you do this, first of all, notice that here's our variables, and we don't have any mention of temperature. So this disappears. We take this out, and our equation is now P1V1 equals P2V2. Because temperature is staying constant, it hasn't been mentioned. We want V2. <coughs> I circle V2 and divide by the other guy. So now I have my equation P1 V1 over P2 will be equal to my V2. I've canceled this. And of course now I put my numbers in. My P1 is 101.3 kilopascals. My V1 is 300 milliliters, and my P2 is 35.5 kilopascals. And all right, what are you getting? Good. 856 to three significant figures would be 856. Okay. I think our can is just about ready. Actually, there were a couple of Boyle's Law demonstrations that I didn't do before we go to Charles. But it's ready. We're also getting a little scattered here. That was looking at what would happen if our air pressure went higher, or rather went lower. What will happen if I, and let's look at that. How can I, you know, we, that's going into the upper atmosphere. Can I do that in the classroom? Yes, I can. That one won't fit. I need a littler one. Ta-da. This is our handy dandy low pressure maker. It's a pump. It's going to pull the particles out from under the dome and create a low pressure zone. Cool? Like a vacuum seal? It's got a vacuum seal. Okay. It doesn't work really well. It's an old one. But let's see what we get. What's happened is it has gone over the hole. Move, move you. Let's try again. As I said, this is a problematic device.
the last one that I had was better in that I had a... Maybe you can like tilt it into the balloon to inside the glass so it doesn't cover the hole. That's what I'm trying to do. You can't actually tilt it. There we go. It's really good that we have an electronic backup. It does get bigger. It doesn't get real bigger here. Electronic backup. You know. So if our equipment were working well, that's what you would have seen. We're going to look at another relationship right now, and that is Charles's law. Okay. Now, unlike Boyle's law, there's no fraction here. So we don't have an inverse relationship. Here we had when, volume, when pressure increases, volume decreases. But here we have the relationship between volume and temperature, which is a direct one. What I have here is a can of hot gas, because I have water in it and it's been heating it up. And I'm going to take it and put it into ice water. What should happen to the gas? I'm going to try to escape quickly. Well, what's going to try to escape? No, no, the heat goes in. Mm -hmm. Because I'm decreasing the temperature, the volume is going to decrease, but nothing can escape. I'm actually going to take it and tip it upside down. It's going to be inverted so that air can't escape. And the volume of the can decreased usually. Okay, it is now no longer 350 milliliters. It's a lot, 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 lot smaller. So there is a direct relationship between volume and temperature. When I rapidly decrease the temperature, going from well over 100 degrees down to about zero degrees, it went much, much smaller. But there is something that we have to really keep in mind with this. The relationship between temperature and gases is um, more complicated than that. Let's go back to our image of the particles moving around. Who knows what absolute zero is? The temperature at which particle motion stops. OK, the temperature at which the particle motion stops. So if you visualize these guys just stopping, the pressure should be zero. The temperature would be the temperature of zero motion, which is, is defined as zero Kelvin. Whenever we work any gas law problems using this, we always have to put it in Kelvin. We can't just say Celsius is OK. So if we want to work a Charles law problem, we have to go, or Gay-Lussac's, or combined anything where we use the temperature, we have to go to Kelvin to do this. So, Zero degrees Kelvin is cold. It's real cold. To go in and out of Kelvin, the equation, oh, and here's our, our graph with our, and that should be a straight line, with our temperature and our volume. And we need to keep in mind that Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273. Whenever we're working math problems, we have to put it in Celsius, into uh, Kelvin. Okay. 
So let's have a look. I love and hate technology. Okay. Let's have a look at our Charles's Law. Okay. You like the can. I used to work at a place where I could get liquid nitrogen, and I can't now. But I always love the liquid nitrogen balloons. Okay. Um, and since I can't do it in class, I capture videos for it. But we're going to move this along. Taking a liquid nitrogen, a balloon, putting it in liquid nitrogen. It's really cool. Pull it out. It's a shrunk and it looks like an empty balloon. And you let it warm up. It's growing. Let's try a Charles's Law problem. Okay. Let me. Let's look at our can. We'll try this one more time. We'll do it on the board. Okay. And our can was at um, a really, really high temperature. Let's call it, um, no. It is not going to work today. OK. My eraser. P1, V1 equals P2, V2 over T1 and T1. It's really easy to remember. PV over T equals PV over T. One's on one side, two's on the other side. Let's look at the liquid nitrogen balloon instead of the, um, instead of the can. Let's say that our balloon was 300 milliliters. And our temperature in the room was 23 degrees Celsius, which is comfortable room temperature. And we put it into a temperature equal to minus 190 degrees Celsius. And we'd like to know what the volume of our balloon will actually be. I want to see everybody solving the equation and calculating it. Don't forget to convert to Kelvin. Plus, you add it. Who has an answer? I'm not seeing your answer. Right. Um, your answer should be in volume. When we look at this, okay. first of all, we have no mention of pressure, so pressure disappears. Get used to the idea of taking this equation, getting rid of the fraction by cross-multiplying. V1 
T1 equals V2 T5. It's V1 T2. V1 T2 equals V2 T1. I am looking for V2. So V1 T2 divided by T1 will equal V2. My V1 is 300 milliliters. What is my T2 in Kelvin? Louder? 83 Kelvin. And what is my T1 in Kelvin? 23 plus 273 is? 296. Hmm? 296. Now, do you see that Kelvin will cancel and our answer needs to be in a unit volume, which would be milliliters. Okay? So watch your watch your units. And 84. Then you always want to finish up with, does it make sense? 84.1 milliliter. We are decreasing the temperature massively the balloon volume should shrink massively. Okay. So make sure your answer makes sense. Okay. Okay. This is so annoying. Okay. Um, Gay-Lussac's is the relationship between pressure and temperature. Okay. If we go back to our animation here, and we put some particles in. We add some gas to it. Pump, 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 pump. There's gas particles coming in. Let's do it as water. Okay. And what they're saying with Gay-Lussac's is we're going to have it be a defined volume, OK? Um, not a balloon that can expand or shrink, but a container that can't change its size. So if we heat it up, the pressure, there'll be more and more particles hitting the side, and the pressure will increase. So if we heat it up, we see the pressure going up, 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 up. And eventually, as the pressure goes high enough, it will pop the lid off. When are we concerned about the effect of pressure on a container? When it's in a closed container. Can you think of a closed container that you've handled that might have the directions on it? Do not put it near a flame. Yeah. Or, uh, kerosene. kerosene. Anything else? Okay, hairspray. Hairspray, any aerosol can. Hairspray, bug spray, sunscreen, you name it. Yes, anything that has a gas in it, it will say do not put it anywhere, anywhere near flame. This is the reason why. If we increase the temperature, we increase the pressure, ultimately it will burst. It will go bang. But usually, we don't see these gas laws happening in, you, in individual. We see them working together. Okay. So let us add one more graph over here. Our Boyle's law is the inverse relationship. Charles's law is a direct relationship, and so is Gay-Lussac's. Gay-Lussac's is the relationship between pressure and temperature. And we see it is a direct relationship. As we increase the temperature, we increase the um, pressure. Now, what happens when we decrease the pressure? What happens to the temperature? To the um, temperature? Hmm? It also decreases. This is counterintuitive. We think it should be getting hotter, but it gets colder. It's called adiabatic cooling. 
Have you ever taken an aerosol can and sprayed it, maybe a bug spray or something, on your hand and it feels cold? Yeah. Okay, that's the reason why. We are decreasing the pressure. When we spray it, it is now at room pressure instead of the high pressure inside the can. So it cools as it goes out. It's also the principle behind refrigeration, a diabetic cooling. Let us try our hand at putting them together with a combined gas law problem. Because things don't generally happen just between pressure and volume, just between volume and temperature, or just between pressure and temperature. Consider, for example, you go for a drive, and it's early morning, and you check the air pressure of your tires, and you fill it the way the manufacturer told you to do it, and you know you're going for a long road trip, and you're heading out into the desert. Okay, the tire is going to heat up, right? It's also going to expand because it's not a container like an aerosol can that can't expand. It's sort of like a balloon. There's a tube inside the tire. So the balloon, the, the tire tube is going to get bigger, it's going to get hotter, and the pressure is going to increase. All of it's going to change. We don't normally have the luxury of just doing one. We get to do it all. I have such respect for you guys that I'm going to give you a real challenge one now. And because it's a real challenge one, I want you to do best practices. I want you to um, take the equation, solve it algebraically before you put any numbers in there, because you're going to get confused if you don't. Your overall equation is P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. Our starting pressure, let's use atmospheres. One atmosphere. Let's use a starting temperature of room temperature, 23 degrees Celsius. Let's use an initial volume equal to 5.0 liters. We're taking a balloon on another journey. Okay. We're going to take it up into the atmosphere again. Um, we're going to take it to where the pressure is equal to 0 0.15 atmosphere. We're going to take it down to where its volume okay, is going to end up being 5, uh, let's make it 4.5. And what I'd like to know is what is the temperature at that place in the upper atmosphere? Our balloon has gotten somewhat smaller. The pressure is getting much lower. And we want to know what is the temperature? This is a weather balloon we've released. Five liters. It's canvas. It can go up that high. 